Warning, the Dutch Talk podcast may contain language and content that may not be suitable for younger audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey there, Dub Talk. It's me, Jabu. I'm here on behalf of Toy Animation to inform you that you have broken several copyright violations and to cease this podcast immediately. Haha, <laughs> nice try there, buddy. Now, where was I? Oh, right. Uh, please be aware that this episode will contain spoilers up to episode 15 of Saint Seiya Nights of the Zodiac, as well as potential spoilers for other series, so please be careful if you haven't finished them. Hey there, Dub Talk. It's me, Jabu. You ignored our previous warning, and our lawyers are currently three minutes away from your location. This is their final warning to cease and desist. Okay, look, man, your sick wasn't even funny the first time. Go bother someone else. Uh, Anyway, last but not least, please be aware that the views and opinions expressed by the individual participants do not reflect those of the Love Talk podcast. Hey there, Dub Talk. It's me, Jabu. We see that you have chosen to ignore our final warning, and our lawyers are currently 30 seconds away from your location. Ugh! Just give it a break already! <sighs> the views and opinions expressed in the individual participants did not reflect those in the Dub Talk podcast as a whole. <sighs> Finally. I'm done. Now please enjoy the show. Hey there, Dub Talk. It's me, Jabu. Our lawyers are right behind you. Oh, shit! Hello, and welcome to Dub Talk, where a band of warriors burn their Cosmo and talk about English subs for anime, both old and new. I'm Leo Jet, and I'm joined tonight by my fellow Gold Saints, Aquarius Roots. And I ran, I ran so far away. Uh, we're already starting with that, huh? <laughs> and Taurus Amon. What? What? Speak up, I can't hear you all the bitchin' tunes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, and we're here for a very special episode of Dub Talk, where we where we're discussing a new dub to the to the Shonen Jump Classic, Saint Seiya: Knights of the Zodiac. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with this series, the basic synopsis from A and goes as follows: uh, Ages ago, the goddess Athena was served by fighters known as Saints, who channeled the powers of the cosmos within them. Now, a new youth named Seiya has trained to become a saint himself, earning the mystical cloth of Pegasus. He's joined by other saints with cloth of their own to fight for Athena. And, uh, yeah, that's the basic gist of it. Uh, but if you're wondering why this is such a big deal, uh, it's because compared to how this franchise performed in the rest of the world, it's had a very, very, very cursed history in North America. Uh, so you see, the original Saint Seiya anime aired in 1986 for most regions of the world. I mean, and for most regions of the world, it is basically up there with Dragon Ball as one of the big tentpole battles shown in from Shonen Jump. Uh, but while Dragon Ball came to North America in the late 90s, where, you know, its look wasn't too dated to hurt it, uh, Saint Seiya didn't come to North America until 2003. Uh, and it came in the form of a dub you might remember called Knights of the Zodiac, which was produced by the late Deek Entertainment, aka the guys who gave us the 90s up to Sailor Moon. And uh, in addition to the, animated, to the animation for that being a little too dated for kids by that point, uh, that dub was pretty heavily edited, had a lot of script rewrites, a lot of edits to the violence. Uh, you know, like all the blood got colored blue or green or whatever the situation called for. Uh, I mean, if you'd like to read more details on that, Land of Obscusion on Twitter actually has like a really good write-up about it on his blog. And uh, it's probably worth checking out if you ever get a chance. Uh, but, but I will say this about the Deep Knights of the Zodiac dub. At the very least, it had a hundred percent more bowling for soup than the original Japanese version. Okay, this is true, but still. 
Uh, anyway, that dub flopped and it was canceled after only 32 episodes and well before it got to the best arc of the story. Uh, later on, ADV Films acquired the home video rights to Saint Seiya, and in addition to putting out the edited Deek dub, they put out their own uncut dub, properly titled Saint Seiya, and they dubbed it up to episode 60. Uh, ADV wanted to continue releasing it, and then ADV kinda died thanks to the anime market crash in 2008. Uh, since then, there were a couple more attempts at releasing Saint Seiya stuff in the United States. And we got simulcasts of stuff like Saint Seiya The Lost Canvas and Saint Seiya Omega Crunchyroll. Uh, which is kind of how I got into the franchise, personally. And uh, we also got uh, Syndigan, who did a re-release of the Barnes ADV down back in the day. Uh, but for the most part, the franchise was just kind of deemed a failure in the United States. And then around 2016, a new Saint Seiya anime project was confirmed and... And later in 2017, they said it was going to be an all 3D CG reboot of the original Saint Seiya anime. And that it was going to be put on Netflix. Uh, leading up to the launch of that, Saint Seiya Lost Canvas hit Netflix eventually and just got a dub out of the random about a year ago. And then the 3D CG reboot finally debuted on Netflix last summer and it's a thing that exists, I guess. Uh, a couple more months passed around, at around October of last year. And we find out Netflix is going to be putting up the original Saint Seiya on their site, making it available in North America the first time in a while. And the assumption was that it was probably going to be streaming some only because no, surely no one was going to pay money to read down something as old and long as Saint Seiya. And then a day of streaming arrived, and it was indeed sub only until a few hours later where a dub was put up. And not only was a dub put up, it, it was a completely new dub featuring the same cast of the reboot. Uh, so, that was a very long history lesson, but the basic moral of the story here, kids, is that if you leave long enough, some giant corporation with way too much money will look at an old anime franchise and be like, 114 episodes? Sure, we can dub that. <laughs> 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 yeah, and as for the real- And Sentai Filmworks replies, challenge accepted. Yeah. And as for the real kicker, as of this recording, the dub has already passed where ADV's dub stopped. So, yeah, so this worked out pretty well. Yeah, I think, like, due, it was uh, apparently due to some production delays, but they're actually, like, producing it up through the, um, I believe it's the Asgard arc that they're working on right now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So, type, so uh, yeah, this is uh, definitely a very weird thing to be talking about, but uh, it exists, so we're covering it. I mean, we're here. Yeah. Um, so, as always, we'll be starting things off by talking about the ADR staff for this, uh, which is a pretty interesting case because unlike those Netflix dubs, as we already kind of established, this one was actually recorded in Houston as opposed to California. And it comes courtesy of our friends at Sentai Filmworks, and who, for those who aren't aware, it is basically the company ADV Films rebranded into after they shut that in 2009. Uh, which makes this whole thing kind of a little ironic. Kyle Kobe Jones was the original ADR director for that dub. And while he still does a lot of stuff at Sentai, he didn't come back at, for this one. I didn't get to talk to him at Anime NYC, though, and he did say that if he had gotten to do this one, he probably would have gotten the old cast back if he could have. Uh, but instead, handling the direction for this dub, we have uh, Joey Gobout and Shannon Reed. I'm sorry if I pronounced that first name wrong. I know I probably did. Um, Shannon Reed is a regular at Sentai, and he's directed dubs for such shows as Flying Witch, Stum's Wish, and the best shoujo anime of the 2010s Fight Me Funimation anime polls, Chihaya Furu. And Joey Gobad, on the other hand, has been around since the ADV days, uh, but mostly on the production end, and he's only really dipped his toes uh, for directing the Blade Runner OVA that came out on Crunchyroll a few years ago. Uh, but he does have one other notable directing credit for dubs, and that would be for the 3D CG reboot of Saint Seiya, called Knights of the Zodiac Saint Seiya, because that's not confusing at all. And uh, Okay, hold look, on a second. In their defense, if you're an English speaker, Knights of the Zodiac is a way better title. Ten-year-old me would not watch a show called Saint Seiya. Ten-year-old me will watch a show called Knights of the Zodiac. I mean... I mean, <laughs> it does have this really nice... Um, 80s airbrushed wizard on a I mean, band. I mean, that, I mean, I mean, that's I'm why 30. That's why 30 year old me wants to watch it. 
because <laughs> it so- it sounds like a it sounds like you know a uh... oh I can't think of any good cheesy metal bands that I like that are they're they're more like fantasy. It sounds like you know one of those Led Zeppelin songs where Robert Plant's rambling on about Lord of the Rings or something. <laughs> God, there were a lot Rob, of those. Rob, there. Rob, you know, everyone thinks Robert Plant's a cool dude because he's handsome and has abs. He's you know he's a huge nerd. Don't let his long yeah. long name fool you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, Joey Gobad was also apparently a producer on the original ADV dub for Saint Seiya, so I guess I might explain the connection here and why he's directing this. Uh, but uh, anyway, as far as scriptwriters go, I asked around, but I actually wasn't able to confirm who handled it. Uh, so for the sake of today's podcast, we'll mostly just be talking about the voice direction, but uh, if you guys do want to like mention anything about the writing that got your attention, feel free. Uh, so, uh, I guess I'll just pick someone at random. I'm on. I, I'm going to put this up front. I'm going to do make a strong effort to not incessantly compare this to the other adaptation that this uh, of a, one of this manga author series that got a dub recently, <laughs> which is also very retro. God, we were, we were both on that episode, weren't we? Um, that said, this, this, this does feel similar to the dub for beat x and that they are both they both feel very much like ah this show is very clearly of the time it was made in a lot of ways and you know beat x's case in the mid 90s i believe and saint Seiya's case the 80s and i think there's very much a sense of like let's make it feel like something from the 80s um probably in better quality i'd say i think this probably sounds a lot better than if saint Seiya had actually somehow been brought over during the reagan years um, but it has that same kind of feel to it. It's very punchy. Uh, there's a lot of like you know noble hero voices. I even think the mixing sounds a little like something you would have that would have been broadcast on like you know mono or basic stereo TV at the time, um, which I think works very well for what the series is. I think if it sounded a little too contemporary, it would look weird with all this you know very 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 eighties animation going on underneath. Um, so I, I'm enjoying it. Um, I think it's presented really well. I think it has that right level of cheese factor that something like Saint Seiya should have. Um, but it's not careless. There's, like, thought put into it. Um, like, it is clearly well-crafted, even if that's kind of the goal they're aiming for. Um, the only thing that really stuck out... Uh, the, only, the main thing that kind of stuck out, actually, was... Uh, <laughs> it was probably just in episode 15 when, like, a swear gets dropped, and I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, it... Like you do hear a, like a couple of shits. Yeah, that was that was just kind of surprising because it's like I could have I was sure they were dubbing this so like kids would watch it. This is unexpected. And uh, uh, no, that would be the three D CG reboot, which weirdly still has it swears in it. Not, that just raises <laughs> further questions. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, what game are you playing, Netflix and or Sentai? What game are you playing? I don't know. You'd have to ask Toei. They're the ones who technically approves all no. of this. Actually, that explains everything. It's Toei. No one knows what they're doing. Okay, no, okay, no that actually makes it weirder. It's Toei. They usually want this stuff to be accessible to kids. Um, so that so that, that particular aspect kind of stuck out given what the show is. Um, but I, 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 I think this is a very nicely done dub. It feels like they are trying to... They're, they're trying to match the source material in a really like fitting way. Um, and again, like, as I mentioned on the Beat X episode, it's kind of a hoot to watch this thing that feels so much like something, you know, watching Ronin Warriors on Late Night Toonami, I think, was when that aired, or something like that. Just kind of this, like, older, or, or, or original Voltron when that was airing on Toonami. I think that's the kind of the main thing this reminded me of. It had that very sort of punchy, televised 80s feel. And I'm digging it. I think it works well. Okay, uh, Roots? Yeah, so... Script writing wise, I know we don't necessarily have a name to go with this like we typically do, but um, bringing up another example with 80s Toei, uh, Dragon Ball Z. As you know, the original dub for DBZ, the the one largely available via Toonami and slightly touched up for DVD and Blu-ray release. Um, it is very loose and liberal with um, with decisions made about character arcs and whatnot. 
Um, and then you have Kai, which is super loyal to what the Japanese were doing with Dragon Ball Z. Uh, the reason I bring this up is um, Saint Seiya, the new Sentai Filmworks dub for it, um, it does a very delicate balancing act between the two. Um, it very much feels like the... Uh, it, it very much feels like what you would expect from a dub of an 80s cartoon. Uh, it definitely has sort of Transformers, G.I. Joe vibes, you know, a little bit of, dare I say it, um, Robotech thrown in there. Um, but it does follow the spirit of the show very, very well. Um... I think the casting decisions for the the main knights and our sort of antagonists, which it doesn't look like we're going to be talking about the Black Knights tonight. I, I don't think they even have a um, an actor credited to them right now. I mean, we can talk about them in passing with uh, the main four, because uh, if you did pick up on it, there is a very clear connection there. Oh... <laughs> <laughs> I thought they yeah, looked I was, similar. I was wondering about that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Probably something that gets explained later, but... As I, as I, I don't know, it's not something that's explained. I think it's just something the dub had fun with. <laughs> okay. Okay, I can... I can definitely get behind that. Anyway. Um... I, I think the casting was really good. I unfortunately have not had a chance to hear the original attempt ADV Films had done with Saint Seiya, mainly because I wasn't into, you know, the purchasing anime scene as they were releasing it. I It would have been right around the time I got into it, and basically I got into buying anime because the local Best Buy was clearing everything out when they were reducing the anime shelf space. I got Evangelion for like 20 bucks. It's still on my shelf. Good times. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, anyway, though, I think the direction is pretty solid. Um, one minor nitpick about the mixing, though. Um, while the sound effects and the wall, uh, and I'm sorry, not the wall, uh, the, the sound effects and Foley... Uh, definitely feel like they were recorded on analog equipment. Um, you can tell the voice acting was recorded via digital because it's it's very clean compared to, you know, the sound effects, the foley, the the music track. Um, there are a few dubs that I can think of, um, Beatex being one of them that tried to blend the two, and I think they did a pretty good job with it. Um, if Sentai or Toei turn around and decide to release this dub via disc, I would probably say it might need a little more mixing before it's ready for that, but otherwise, and that's really kind of a minor nitpick in the grand scheme of things. It's it's similar to a nitpick I have with the um, Studiopolis redub of Sailor Moon. Yeah. Um, but I think, I think otherwise... Everything on the technical side was pretty good. Um, so thumbs up. Okay. Okay, uh, so having actually sat through the 3D CD reboot, it is sort of interesting to compare the difference in vocal direction between those two. Uh, because it actually is pretty different, despite this having basically the same cast, bearing like maybe one recast. Uh, so, uh, while Goey Gobao's voice direction for the reboot had a lot of the characters, uh, speaking kind of loosely and with some quips that made the whole thing feel more like an action cartoon that, you know, would have aired on Cartoon Network in the late 2000s or early 2010s, rather than something based off of an old 80s shonen manga. The direction for this version sounds a lot more cheesy and a little over-dramatized at times, that in ways that almost feel a little hokey. And while that would sound like something that would be a knock against this stuff, it actually kind of works. And I really appreciate that doing Go About and Chad and Reed really went this route with it. And since some of that hookiness actually kind of works to the benefit of the material. And while not every performance here lands necessarily, they're always at least very fun to listen to. 
And the overall style of it makes it feel like it's actually was done in the 80s as opposed to recently. And I mean that in the best way possible, since it, be, since it feels like they really knew what they were going for with this. Uh, well, unfortunately, we don't know who quite did the adaptive script. I can't say that it... I can't say that having compared the two, it is a pretty solid one-to-one -one of the subtitle track on most ends. And with the extra edition of, of course, a few more swears and, you know, getting a little cheesy with some of the action dialogue every now and then, but in a way that feels very 80s, and I'm definitely very here for that. Uh, it certainly isn't perfect, but considering I wasn't expecting this thing to exist, if it's going to be the definitive English version of Saints Day for North America, I definitely feel that they got the right team for the job. Uh, if I have one nitpick with the translation, it's that I do kind of get annoyed with how inconsistent they can be with the terminology sometimes. I admit it enough, in some episodes, they refer to the characters as saints. In some episodes, they refer to them as knights. In some episodes, they'll use the term cloth, or sometimes they'll use armor, and it's a little annoying. Uh, later episodes kind of fix this, so I don't know if it was like some weird mandate Toei had, but it is kind of annoying. But other than that, I'm pretty happy with this. And with that, I guess we're going to start talking about the actual actors yeah. on the show. All right. Um, so we're going to be talking about a lot of boys tonight, so we're going to get both of the ladies out of the way here. Uh, so first up, we have Miho, Shunray, Eco Baron, and Osai Fish China. Uh, Miho and Shunray are friends of Saiya and Shiryu, respectively, while Marion is Saiya's master who trained him from a young age to become a saint. Uh, Shina, on the other hand, is another saint from Greece who despises Saiya for dis defeating her disciple Cassios, and wants revenge against him after he defeats her in battle. Miho is played by Avery Smithheart. Shunray is played by Hilary Hank. Marion is, is played by Maggie Fleckaway. And Shina is played by Caitlin Barr. Uh, Avery Smithheart has played such characters as Goe Ishikawa from Release of Price, Cinnabar from Land of the Illustrious, and Rosetti Prickett from Assassin's Pride. Hilary Hag has played such characters as Lucy Hugo from Food Wars The Second Plate, Hanasone Shiranui from Mineka Box, and Yasako from Dodo Coil. Uh, Maggie Fleknoe has played such characters as Hayui Mitsumiya from Haikyuu, Yaku Minigishi from Food Wars, and Rogata Kikijima from Maneka Box. Uh, lastly, Caitlin Barr has played such characters as uh, Dominante Code from Black Clover, Ryukyu from My Hero Academia, and Golden Darkness into Love Rue. So, uh, Roots, why don't you start us off this time? Okay, sure. Um, honestly, I don't remember much of what, um, <clears throat> of um miho from the from the first couple of episodes um i i do know that she's one of Seiya's childhood friends from the orphanage but really i i don't remember a lot of what the character did i i do know um avery gave a really a not bad performance uh for the character i just I don't remember much of what she was actually there for. Um, just other than to be moral support for Saya. I mean, it doesn't feel too bad. Like, I literally kind of forgot this character existed until I rewatched this. Yeah. Um, at the very least, um, I can't say the same about Shunrei. Um, well, she too doesn't do all that much in the course of the show other than, you know, uh, show concern for Shiryu every once in a while um, with his with his teacher, whom we'll be talking about here in a segment coming up. Um, like, she does very much come off as, um, you know, the, the very kind... Is she related to Shiryu, or are they just... I can give you a very weird not-spoiler, because it doesn't really apply to anything in this show, but it is a spoiler for Omega. <laughs> uh, uh, would, you, uh, would you care if I told you? I'm okay with it. Oh, so, uh, yeah, she and Shiryu, they beg. They have a kid. <laughs> oh. 
Oh. <laughs> That would explain oh the strong girlfriend energy she had. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Um, so, yeah, I guess... I guess someone just kind of nailed it right there. Um, uh, she gives Shunrei... Uh, I mean, Hillary gives Shunrei a very strong girlfriend vibe. Um, yeah. Uh, Maggie Fleckenrow as Marin. I I really like her sort of harsh teacher tone that she gives um, she gives towards Saya. And um, yeah, totally not a suspicious character who is not in any way related to Saya. No, no. What are you talking about? That's for Paulus. <laughs> He's clearly an orphan. No fan. Uh, sorry, wait, uh, wait, what are you saying? Her hair looks close to Saya's sister? I, I don't know what you're talking about there. I... Uh, she wears a mask. Uh, Clearly there's no symbolism mm -mm. behind that. Mm -mm. Um, but I do like Maggie Fleckenow's performance. Um, like, she is really harsh toward Seiya during his training. Um, and I will say this about Shina. Um, as is the case with a couple characters in Saint Seiya, I actually like the performance a little better in Knights of the Zodiac and uh, her characterization. Um, it, yeah, I'm definitely going to be... Yeah, I'll probably agree with you there slightly. Because <laughs> she actually does get a really good fight with Seiya in the reboot. Um, whereas in the original, you know, Seiya refuses to fight her because she's she's a girl. And, I mean, I will say later episodes rectify that slightly, but her arc also gets kind of annoying at that end, so it's, it's, it's one of those things I'm kind of glad the reboot and later iterations of the series kind of acknowledge was really dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I, I will admit, like, the shonen protagonist refusing to fight a girl because she's a girl, it's a trope that gets really annoying really quick, and, like, every shonen series from the 80s to probably, like, the early half of the first decade of the 2000s do it. In some form. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but... But yeah, I uh, getting back to the performance, um, Caitlin Barr, I do think she really nails the sort of um, mentor role trying to get revenge for her fallen student kind of deal. Also, I do have to admit, because it doesn't look like we're going to be talking about him, like, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Cassius. Uh, yeah, yeah, Cassios. Um, that was Andrew Love, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, I like the performance there as well. Is that, uh, is that, like, uh, uh, yeah, but he definitely has a little more to do with the reboot because uh, he doesn't die right away. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. I mean, I will, I do appreciate the expediency of Knights of the Zodiac's treatment of the Black Knights, but it does kind of lose something in translation. Uh. Like, the pacing kind of sucked in the original, <laughs> but, you know, you get more characterization out of it. Uh, to, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a little half and half on that. Like, the pacing here is a little slow, but by Toei's standards, this show actually moves pretty quickly. Like, like, okay, like, it's, like, it's definitely not Dragon Ball Z slow. Yeah. But then, I also... I kind of came to Ascending Discovery doing research for this, because apparently the manga was released in one of the first issues of Weekly Shonen Jump in 1986. And then the anime came out, like, nine months later. Uh, yeah, I was like, uh, yeah, but uh, Jump was uh, definitely like that back then. If I recall, I think Hunter x Hunter also had a really fast turnaround. Yeah, I I looked at that and then I'm just like, you know what? 
That explains mm. the pacing issues, and that explains the huge amounts of filler that come later. Mm. Oh, yeah, there is a lot of filler. That's why it's not that bad, actually, but there is a lot of it. Mm. Um, but all, all said, the um, the ladies of Saint Seiya all do really good jobs with their performances. Um, I know some of them do big things later, but it's, like, first 15 episodes is just kind of... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm on. Hmm. Let's see. I think I, I think I agree on a lot of those points. Um, is Miho say is Miho Seiya's love interest? Because she also had strong like girlfriend vibes. Uh, like I said, I did not remember the character existed until I rewatched this, so that did kind of answer your question hmm. right there. So I, 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 Avery did a perfectly nice job with a character who clearly <laughs> doesn't have a lot going on. Um, she's fine. Uh, I have no complaints. She did. She did. Clearly, this I'm assuming this character does not show up again. So you know, she did good with what she's doing, or at least doesn't have a lot to do. I mean, oh no, she does show up in later episodes again. I just kind of forgot she's there because she's not that important in the grand scheme of things, unfortunately. <sighs> It is an 80s Shonen Jump manga, isn't it? Um, what else? Yeah, I, I, Hilary Hag, I thought, was very nice as Shunrei. I think, in part, it helps that I think she does have a little more to do, if only because they have the whole, you know... What's his name? Uh, it, it, it. Uh, yeah, sh Shiri, Shiri, the master is dying. You need to come back. <laughs> oh my god, you're dead! <laughs> I, just, I just came here to tell him the master wasn't feeling well, and I lied to him, and now my boyfriend's dead. I made a terrible mistake. Um, I, I I thought she I thought she had a lot of fun. I thought she I enjoyed her in that role. Uh, I thought she was fun. Uh, but I really like I like this Maggie and Caitlin as their characters. I thought they did a very good job of feeling, um, you know, playing sort of you know these you know tough. I, I it was it, as we can tell as we're going to see the cast of the show is very male dominated. And it was kind of fun getting to see some women do some of the kind of like you know bombastic shonen stuff in this show because I I, I I I'm not super familiar with Saint Say in general so I'm not sure like if how how you know what sort of the gender balances in the long run but it's kind of fun watching them do that and mm -hmm. um as I, uh, in this in this version not so much and like most of the later stuff it's definitely a lot more gender balanced. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, I had a lot of fun hearing them get to kind of, you know, these, you know, they're fighting and they're wearing armor and I'm going to avenge my student and you need to go back to Japan and take care of this stuff. Um, they had a lot of fun doing that. And it sounds like, I'm, I'm assuming Marin shows up again later. <laughs> oh, yeah, she shows up a lot. All right, that's good. Episodes. Um, yeah, no, they, they, they're for performances. I'd be, look, I'm looking forward to seeing them again. Um, if I had a... This isn't a complaint, and this isn't unique to any of these characters. This is a kind of ongoing thing, but... This is kind of related to maybe, like, Roots is talking about the mixing in the last section, where the performances in this show aren't flat, but the way they, like, physically sound coming out of my TV sounds flat in a weird way. Um, and then you'll, I'll, I'll talk about this more when we get to the lead characters, where, like, they don't sound indistinguishable, but there's a certain similarity in the performance that I find curious. Um, and you get the, I think you, you can see a little bit of that here between like Miho and Shunrei on one side and Marin and uh, Shaina on the other, where they're not they're not the same and, they're, and, the, and their actors aren't giving the same performance. But I feel like you know if I wasn't looking at the TV and you asked me who's talking right now, I'd be like I have no idea, couldn't tell you. Um, I mean, said that I, I, this, is, this is a nice set of performances. Um, you know, for for some characters, kind of giving more of the actors to work with than others. Okay. Um, so I'll start with Hillary Hack as June Ray, since uh, she doesn't have too, too much to do here. Uh, she's mainly there to be another form of support for Hiru besides his master, who is, uh, we'll get to him later. And, uh, Hillary Hag does a pretty good job getting across a lot of her concern for Hiru, and, you know, uh, then I kind of felt for her when she was put in the very awkward position of having to lie to Hiru about his master dying, which was kind of a weird thing to pull. <laughs> Uh, but mostly... <laughs> this master's a dick. Um, I'm just gonna put that out here right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, though, it's just kind of nice to hear Hillary Hag and something new again, since he isn't in use of dubs as often as he used to be. 
And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing more of her as the show goes on, as he definitely does show up in more episodes, so that's cool. Uh, Avery Smith Hart, Avery Smith Hart as Mia was also kind of in a similar position, uh, but she has uh, slightly more to do in this past few episodes, and you know, uh, being a childhood friend, since well, being a childhood friend means he kind of has no real chance, and so much of a little chance, and I again, I kind of forgot she existed until I watched the show on Netflix. Uh, but uh, either way, Avery Smith Hart still does a pretty good job of making her, you know, sound very sweet and flustered, and you know, she's. Not very good at hiding how interesting she is. And, um, uh, it's something kind of interesting hearing Avery Smith Hart play this kind of role because, uh, for a little of her I've seen, I generally associate Avery Smith Hart with, you know, a uh, very soyuk or kind of mature girl to think or play the, you know, very emotional, very high pitched childhood friend was kind of interesting. And, uh, well, I don't know how much longer she'll be in the show. It was definitely a very fun performance to listen to so far. Uh, moving on to Maggie Fleckner as Marin. Uh, I've been kind of mixed, mixed on her as an actress ever since my first introduction to her, which was, uh, in a big a drum dub, and she wasn't, uh, too great in that. Uh, but I definitely liked her here. And uh, while we don't see too much of Marin in the first few episodes, uh, Maggie does a really good job of making her, you know, sound very wise and confident, while also making it clear that she won't put up with, say, whipping out. Uh, my favorite bit being the flashback where she's teaching young Saya how to use his Cosmo, and she kind of mocks him for almost smashing his head while trying to break a rock. And, you know, just another... And there's also another bit in one of the later episodes that we unfortunately aren't getting to here, where she beats up Saya for going to her for guidance instead of helping his friends, and it's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> it's, so, it's kind of the perfect dissolution of the kind of guard that was just all over the place in the 80s and 90s showed in. And Mackie's delivery definitely really sells that level of cheese. Uh, but at the same time, while she is very harsh, you can kind of tell that Merritt is also, you know, very concerned for Saya. And Mackie's performance definitely manages to show a few glimpses of warmth underneath that whole sort of demeanor. Uh, again, she obviously has a lot more to do with the coming episodes, but for what we got so far, I thought Mackie is handling her pretty well. And uh, this is definitely one of my favorite performances of hers. Uh, all that being said, though, the standout of this section for me is definitely Caitlyn Barr as China, because uh, China is just a lot of fun in general. Uh, both in the 80s and even in modern China, you don't get too many female characters who are as tough as nails as she is. And right off the bat, Caitlyn's voice just gives her a sense of presence that makes it clear this is one lady you definitely don't want to screw around with. And uh, she sounds intimidating in almost every scene she's in. And of course, she also very much has an out for Seiya, and, it, and I like that in addition to how tough she sounds... Uh, Caitlin's voice that also has a right level of spite and nastiness to it to make it sound incredibly entertaining. And it almost always feels like she's just one line with away from saying something like, I'll get you next time, Saya, and your little dog, too. <laughs> next time, Gadget. <laughs> next time! Uh... I also really, I also really love her delivery when as she kind of delivered the immortal line of saying, "Say it can only throw a measly eighty-five punches per second," and it was just kind of gives you a very immediate idea of how stupid the power levels in this show are, and I definitely very much appreciate that. And I also like that again, while the show is definitely not perfect when it comes to how female characters are treated, and there's one aspect of China's character later on that I'm definitely very. Glad every other iteration of the franchise is kind of called out for being very stupid. I do like that when Saya says he can't fight her because he's a woman, it's immediately followed by Marin being like, she's literally trying to kill you. Come on, fight. <laughs> uh, I mean, again, it's kind of a shame we only really see China in one episode out of what we're covering tonight. Uh, but she shows up a lot of the later episodes, and it's definitely one of my favorite performances of the dub, and probably my favorite performance of Caitlyn, so I definitely like it a lot. And uh, with that, I guess we're good to move on to our next batch of characters. Alrighty. Alright. Uh, okay, so next up we're going to be coming, covering some of the other Bronze Saints out of the main five. We have Hydra Ichi, Wolf Nachi, Barageki, and Unicorn Jabu. Uh, these four all show up as opponents of Saiyan and the others in the Galaxian Wars. And as for who plays them, Hydra Ichi is played by Justin Doran. Wolf Nachi is played by Cameron Bouts. Barageki is played by Adam Noble. And Unicorn Jabu is played by Loraldo Azadala. And Justin Doran is played such characters as 
Takahiro Aramaki from Seven Seeds, uh, Fukase and Haven't Even Heard on Sakamoto, and Daichi Sawamura from Haikyuu, uh, Cameron Bouts has played such characters as Sora Kuratami from Ahiro no Sora, Tadashi Yamaguchi from Haikyuu, and funny enough, Young Seiya in the ADV dub for Saint uh, Seiya. Weird. Oh yeah, he's been around a while. Oh yeah, he's been around a while. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure he played Ushio with the old Ushio and Tora dub. Huh. Yeah. Um, Wait, didn't the actor who played... Oh, oh, young Ushio. It's a, it's a, it's a, oh, no, oh, no he, um, I'm pretty... Yeah, I guess he played young Ushio. Yeah, because the... Um, uh, oh, yeah, the original actor. The there. actor who played actual Ushio in the original Ushio in Tora dub is unfortunately no longer with us. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, moving on, uh, Adam Noble has played such characters as uh, Shira from Makabe Got Kill, uh, Mikito Minato, Mi, ah, God, I gotta butcher this, uh, Mikito Minatozaka from Food Wars, and Chikara and Ashita from Haikyuu, and lastly, Lorado Azadala has played such characters as Kei Tsukishima from Haikyuu, Ryo Kurakiba from Food Wars, and a personal favorite of mine, Zed from Kiba, for anyone who remembers that show on Toonami Jetstream. Oh my god. <laughs> Fucking Kiba, man. Uh, I wish that had actually gotten an actual Toonami, but it wasn't meant to be, I guess. Uh, so, Amon, would you like to start us off here? Although I'm going to have to preface that with saying that I don't particularly remember about three quarters of these characters, because it's been a bit since I watched the first few episodes. <laughs> Uh, I mean, no, that's fair. They don't have that I, much time. I, I was kind of surprised to learn that there are people in this show who are saints, but also not important. Uh, I think my understanding of how the show worked was a little flawed up until I actually watched it. As I, uh, yeah, uh, type, yeah. Uh, the lore of Saints is kind of weird, but uh, the way it generally works is there are 88 for the 88 constellations. So. Give, give himself, he, uh, what's, what's his name is going to give himself a nice big number so he can just pull characters out when he needs them. I see. <laughs> that, makes, yeah. that, that checks out. <clears throat> um, so, uh, Jabu, Geki, and Nachi, they're all, they, they all, they all, memory serves, they all sound pretty good for what they are. Uh, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're semi antagonists. They fight our heroes. They sound good for kind of their character types. Um, they, they, they sounded good, um, but I think just because they're, they're minor characters who don't do a lot for very long, they didn't stick in my brain very well. However, I will give kudos to Justin as Ichi, because I do remember Ichi, partially because he looks like he's, he's from the Mad Max school of uh, character design, and I always appreciate when that pops up in <laughs> 80s anime. <laughs> Every, everyone forgets that the entire anime industry just went apeshit for the Road Warrior. Just absolutely apeshit. Um... I liked I liked I liked his character a lot. Um, he like design wise, he's by far the most distinct of this group in the first place, and I think I think Justin gave him a wonderful performance to match that. Um, that fight he has with Cygnus, I think, yeah, whose whose who's character name I can't yeah. remember. Um, but I, I liked that fight. I thought that felt very. That was one of the not like the first good fight, but that was kind of like as far as kind of like these. It was a good. It was a good example of kind of like this is how fights are gonna work in Saint Seiya. They have these powers with their cloth, and there's gonna be a lot of like, this is how mine works, and this is how your works, and this is how I'm going to beat you. Um, you fool! You only penetrated the top layer of my armor. You absolute moron. <laughs> um, I thought just adjusted. I thought played that character really well. He did a very good job of playing up kind of like the grody nastiness of the character and he uses all this poison and he has these big you know 90s x-men character looking claws uh he, he i thought i had a lot of fun um he's, he's the big one who stood out in this um group and like kudos to him for that i thought he did a i thought he was given like a fun character to play and i thought he really brought it home in that regard um i can't remember if that character died or not i i suspect although i suspect we don't see a lot of any of these people again I don't know, he's okay. alive. Uh, fun fact, he actually shows up in Saint Seiya Omega. <laughs> and uh, he's one of the only characters in that version who is still somehow a broad saint. Amazing. <laughs> um, so yeah, kudos to Justin and kudos to the to uh, Laredo, Adam, and Cameron for doing pretty for doing, doing well with, you know, limited characters. He did good. Uh, okay, uh, Roots. 
Um, yeah, so... Basically, my memory of Geki and Nachi are basically the big guy and the kind of tricky guy. Um, yeah. And I... What I can remember of the performances, I, I thought they were okay. Um, like, nothing to write home about, but they were also, like, a... Like, a step above, like, a typical Walla performance for a show. Which is also not to degrade Walla performances, um... But you're honestly just there to read from the phone book, so it sounds like a bunch of people are talking. <clears throat> anyway, um... <coughs> I do want to talk about Jabu for a sec, because, um... Uh, what little you get from Saint Seiya proper, and he actually gets, like, slightly more to do in Knights of the Zodiac, but not by much. Um, like, I, I like him. He's a bit of a wisecracker. I, I hope he's somebody who... It feels like he's one of the ones who's gonna show up later. Um, I don't remember exactly how much he shows up, but I know he is a fairly popular character, so he is referenced a lot, but... Okay. And then, of course, um, a lot of the things um, Amon was saying about Hydra Ichi, like, I, I really like that fight as well. Um, because, um, as Amon was saying, it's basically a setup to how... How 80 shonen these fight scenes get. Like, you know... Hey, this is how I punch. Haha, -ha, you fool. Do you not know that I have studied how you punch? <laughs> and I'm going to punch you a different way. This way you do not know. Oh, no! Haha, <laughs> -ha, but that punch was too weak. Let me show you my other punch. Oh, God. Other punch, you say. Anyway. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm I'm here all week. Uh, so you're done? But yeah, the um, I I actually really like um Justin's performance as Hydra Ichi. Uh the fight was really cool and yeah. Thumbs up. Cool. Uh, so, I'll start with uh, Cameron Bowers as Wolf Nachi since he kind of has the least amount of screen time. Uh, I haven't been the biggest fan of Cameron Bowers for the shows I've heard him in, but for the few lines he got here, I thought he sounded pretty fun. Uh, Wolf Nachi was just kind of there to get beat up by Iki, but I definitely appreciated how cheesy Cameron's delivery was during Wolf Nachi's transformation sequence where he equips all of his body armor. Uh, I imagine it wasn't... It wasn't you know, very easy to keep a straight face while dramatically shouting, head, knees, shoulders. But he definitely, eh, but he definitely made that work and got a real kick out of it. Now, uh, Justin Doran also didn't have, like, too, too much to do with Hydra Ichi. Uh, but having seen the dub for the reboot, it actually is kind of interesting hearing how it differs his performance sounds and that compared to this one. Uh, in the reboot dub, they actually made Hydra Ichi sound, you know, very deep and intimidating, whereas here he has, like, the most goofy and cartoonly, cartoonishly nasally voice imaginable. And about the only way I, I was able to make an immediate connection between the two is when uh, Hyoga freezes his arm and he says, It's so cold, like ice. And the, and the delivery was basically the same in both versions, which was kind of funny. Uh, so I definitely got a pretty good kick out of that. Uh, I'll admit the voice itself was one of those things that probably wouldn't work if it was being done for a modern show, but it's just so silly and over the top that, that it just kind of worked for how 80s this is. And I was definitely very entertained by it, even if Jetson's actual vocal delivery wasn't always the best there. Uh, moving on to uh, Orado Azadala's Jabu. I've definitely been a fan of his work ever since I heard him as Zed and Kiba back in the day, since that's one of maybe two Seaman Foster dubs I actually liked. And it's always kind of nice hearing him do things. Uh, but as far as this show goes, though, Jabu is just kind of a scrub, and Liraldo does a really great job of making him sound like he wants you to think he's the toughest guy in the room, while he... And instead, he's just getting dunked on at every opportunity. And my favorite bit where Sam runs into him in episode 2 and Sam just calls him out for being sour his little whipping boy. And I also kind of like the bit where he tries to paint Shoot as a whip and then Shoot just immediately kicks the crap out of him. And I thought that was pretty funny. 
Uh, and it, it's really great. And, you know, like with Justin Dora and his Hydra AG, it's only kind of interesting seeing how his performance sounds here as compared to the reboot. As it's a, in the reboot, he sounds a lot smoother and a little bit lighter while here his voice is a lot gruffer. And I definitely appreciate that they went the extra mile to make both um, sound to sync from each other while keeping the same cast. And uh, it definitely makes it a, a lot more fun as an experience. Uh, all that said, for me, the most entertaining performance for me here was probably Adam Noble as Marageki. Because you can just kind of tell this, he was having way too much fun in the move. Uh, like with just Adora and Aziji, it was just one of those things that probably wouldn't work if you slapped this onto a modern show. But because you're dealing with something this old, Adam's super cheesy delivery kind of works in the dog's favor. I never got a really good kick seeing him go on and on about how beefy his arms are and how many bears he strangled with them. And I appreciate that you asked me to get a flashback of him just talking about how he traded Rocky Mountain strangling bears all the time. Preposterous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, but the most amazing thing is that it's actually not that impressive by the show's standards, which is kind of hilarious in its own way. It's like, oh, you only strangled a few bears. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, in general, I don't remember if these four come back to too much, even though they're all the opening song. But I know at least John Boo is referenced in other Saints Day and stuff, so we'll probably see him again at least. Uh, but either way, I definitely enjoyed all four of these gentlemen, all four of these gentlemen even if it wasn't exactly for the same reason. And uh, next up, we'll move on to some more characters. This time we have... Uh, some of the allies of the Saints. Uh, we have Master Doko, Master Mu, uh, Mitsumata Kido, and Tokumaru Tatsumi. Uh, Master Doko is Shiryu's master who trained him to become the Dragon Saint. Uh, master Mu is a mysterious craftsman who is the only man in the world who can repair cloths and helps Shiryu after his and Seiya's cloths get destroyed during their fight with Iki. And uh, Mitsumasa Kido is the late grandfather of Sayori and the founder of the Garan Foundation who took in Sei and all the other orphans as they were trained to be saints. And Tatsumi worked for the Garan Foundation and I guess he's Sayori's butler, I guess. It doesn't really specify exactly what he does, but all you need to know is that this guy is just the actual worst. Um, like, three quarters <laughs> of this category, like, at one point or another in the course of the show are the absolute I, I worst. And even the fourth one in the reboot has an element of absolute I, I, I like worst. Point out, when Iki first shows up and he starts threatening Tatsuma, like I think was, yeah, kick his ass, he deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, playing Master Doko, we have John Swayze. Uh, for Master Mu, we have John Vermillion. Uh, for Mitsumasa Kida, we have Marty Fleck, who also doubles as a narrator for this dub. And for Tatsumi, we have Taimahade. Uh, John Swayze has played such characters as Adoria in Dragon Ball Z Kai, Sir Crocodile in One Piece, and weirdly enough, Hydra Ichi in the ADV dub of Saint Seiya. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? Uh, John Gramillion has played such characters as Dracula Mihawk in One Piece, uh, Roland Chappelle in Food Wars, and Gigas in the ADV dub of Saint Seiya. Uh, Marty Fleck has played such characters as Drossomile and Princess Sutu, Kazuna Hyodo and Richard Tanagawa's Middle Management Blues, and uh, Kaki no, uh, no Shin Ozumizu from Food Wars, the second plate. Boy, I'm really butchering names tonight. Uh, lastly, Tai Mahadi has played such characters as Tetsuron Kuro from Haikyuu, Gin Dojima from Food Wars, and and uh, be, and just because I know this one will upset Megan if she hears this episode, Shu Sakabaki from Diabolic Lovers. Anyway, roots go. All right. Um, I mean, I kind of spoiled my joke earlier with the this group is like in one way or another the absolute worst of this show. Um, John Swayze's Doko is just. An absolute dick to Shiryu. Like, just... Oh, yeah. You know, if you want the, the dragon armor, you've got to reverse the flow of this massive waterfall. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. <clears throat> You're just going to have to figure it out for yourself. Oh, 
I could help you. Or I could tell you where the man who can repair yours and say his armor is, but I'm not going to do it. Just, I mean, I get the fact that as a, a teacher, you have to kind of encourage your student to find the answers on their own. But at the same time, what a dick. And, um... John Swayze does a really good job of playing Doko as sort of wise and mischievous. I I loved it every second he was on. Um, John Gramelian's Master Moo, on the other hand, um, I like how warm the performance is. Um, I like the fact that he was sort of taken aback when Shiryu agreed to give up his life force to repair his armor and Seiya's. Um, and going back to the subject of the reboot, I actually really do like the fact he just kind of shows up for ten minutes and it's implied he's going to do something insidious. Just because I watched it, I watched the performance of the original Saint Seiya right beforehand, and you know the benevolence of that, and just sort of Doko implying Mu is gonna do something bad. Like I actually, I actually really like that as sort of a twist. Um, I liked um. First and foremost, I like Marty Flex narration. Um, given that my knowledge of Marty Fleck is basically Kyoto and Drosselmeyer, hearing him play somebody who is projecting in such a warm manner is a little bit strange, but also refreshing. And same can be said about... Uh, Mitsumasa, even though, you know, it is implied that his intentions are not the purest. Or if they are, there's, you know, some sort of sacrifice that had to take place. I'm actually curious to watch the show further and, and see that mystery unravel a little more if it does. Um, and Taimahaney is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> like Tokumaru Tatsumi is the actual worst. Yeah, are we sure he's not the villain of this show? <laughs> <laughs> he may as well be. Like he's basically kidnapping orphans and sending them to the four corners of the world to probably die, all to collect pieces of mystical cloth that turn into armor. So that he can then send them all back to Japan to fight each other. Like, but the part I like most about it is, like, he doesn't try to hide the fact that he is the absolute worst. Like, he's just, yeah, I'm a dick, so what? Yeah, uh, you get to go to the island of death in the South Pacific. Bye-bye. Go on. Shoot, 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 get, get, shoot. Island of death, island of death, shoot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, all all four of these performances were really great. I really enjoyed them. Thumbs up. Okay, uh, I'm on. I'm, uh, I'm in strong agreement here. Um, Do Doko is terrible. I, I like the part where he, you know, um, uh, Shiryu comes back and turns out Doko's fine. He's like, ah, yes, look at you. Caring about people in your life. That's a weakness, don't you know? You should get rid of that. <laughs> like, wow, you're a real piece of work, aren't you? Um, but John Swayze's... I really enjoy John Swayze as him. He does a good job channeling that kind of, like, you know, you know ancient master you see in a, like, Shaw Brothers kung fu movie kind of a feel. Uh, you know, he, he's very wizened, and he's also an asshole. <laughs> And he's probably not going to get any comeuppance for that based on what this show is. But you can you can just kind of you can just hope he doesn't pop around too much and sure he can be left in peace. Um, but I like I like Swayze's performance as him. I thought he was um, I thought it was I thought it was very entertaining and very well done. 
especially for what that character is. Um, what else? I, I also liked uh, John Gramillion as Moom. I thought there was this nice, you know, there's this calmness to him. Like, he, he is a character who demands a lot, but when he will, he will recognize, like, immense sacrifice when it's seen, it's like, okay, you actually want to, like, you know, he recognized Shiryu's selflessness, and it's like, no, I'm not going to help you. you. You don't have to die today. Uh, there are bigger things at stake than that. And I, and I thought he, he gave a good performance where that felt... It didn't feel, like, uh, contradictory, I guess. Like, that felt like uh, that felt like something the character would actually do. Um, which, uh, which I enjoyed. Um, Marty Fleck is... He's just, he seems very sweet as as Mr. Keto, even if I'm wondering why exactly he's agreeing to all this let's send orphans to maybe die kind of thing. It's like, and you're like <laughs> adults, professionals, people who, who aren't likely to get murdered. No? Children? Okay. Um, that's a little shady, but whatever. You seem okay. Um, now there's, there's this nice it's kind of a bunkular quality to his performance that I, 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 think, I think plays well even with this possibly unexplored aspect of his character, at least in this version of the show. Um, let's get to the real star, which is Ty Mahaney, who's just, he just, just the worst, just plays the worst man. Just awful. <laughs> what a jackass. It's like, ah, yes, my life of the cloth, What's, what, what should I care about more? You know damn well what you should care about more. The armor, obviously. You're expendable. <laughs> I to death. Just I to death. Just, just no no repentance about how little he actually cares about any of these people. Just like nope, you're a means to an end. I'm not gonna lie to you, and I'm also gonna beat you up because you 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 made me look bad in front of the boss. Ten year old boy. Just, Ty, Ty plays him really well though. He's he's very good at playing just the correct level of like awful slime ball. <laughs> I I. I look forward to more of Ty's performance. I don't, I'm not sure I'm looking forward to more of um, Tatsumi personally. But, you know, hey, if he shows up more often, then someone might beat him up. And that would bring me joy, so. <laughs> and I mean, somehow, through some sort of sorcery of script writing, um, Tatsumi is both less and more of an asshole Amazing. than Nice of the Zodiac. Yeah, no, I like uh, this is a good <laughs> group of performances. Thumbs up. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll start with John Gramillion as Moo, since uh, John Gramillion is a name we don't really get to talk about too often. And it's kind of a shame because I've always really liked his voice and I kind of wish he got cast in more stuff. And I like that he does a really great job of making Moo seem, you know, equally wise and equally mysterious, since uh, while he is something. Since while he is very helpful to Shiryu, there's also just something about it that seems strange and that'll be important later on. And when I say important, I mean that even wicking this character will probably tell you his actual identity, so by all means, do not do that. Yeah, too late. I did that already trying to remember what he looked like. That was my bad. Don't look at the wikis or anime planet, people. Just don't do it. Save yourself the spoil. Yeah. Uh, I also thought he did a really good job of balancing that air of mystery with a bit of compassion, since while he was kind of initially reluctant to help Shiryu... Uh, seeing a length he was willing to go for for his friends definitely seemed to have won him over a little bit. And uh, John made that, new, made that bit of newfound respect feel pretty genuine. I also did a, thought John Swayze did, did a pretty good job of Doko, even if that was definitely a lot more in his general wheelhouse. And I appreciate that he did a really good job of playing the wild old master without getting too over the top of it. And also that the dub didn't try to give him, like, an accent or anything, since he's from China, and, uh, yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> glad he didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, looking at you, vanishing line. Uh, I'm still kind of weirded out by that bit where he lies to Shiryu about being on his deathbed as a test result, since that's kind of messed up even by 80s standards. Uh, but Don definitely made that work. And he kind of makes it look like Doku's always, you know, looking at the bigger picture, even if his actions in the moment are also kind of odd. Uh, he's also another character whose actual identity can be very easily spoiled if we wiki him, and while I don't know if the devil will actually get around to the Hades arc, uh, since that was done as OVAs and Toei totally might get weird about streaming that. Uh, but if that does happen, I'm kind of curious if they'll recast on Switch or if they'll have do, or if they'll just have him change his voice a little bit, because, uh... Doku definitely gets to do some very interesting stuff there. 
Uh, but uh, anyway, moving on to Marty Flacco's Mitsubasa Kido. Uh, Marty Flacco is another name I wish we got to talk about more frequently since it's always kind of nice to hear him in new things. And uh, well, since this character isn't around that much, since he's, you know, kind of dead, then the flashbacks we get with him do kind of help to paint him as a very grandfatherly figure and, you know, fairly reasonable, which, we which feels very weird to say about a guy who effectively snatched up a bunch of orphans and sent them to remote parts of the world to train in blood sports. Uh, yeah, the whole Garage Foundation's general MO is pretty much mm. up when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but either way, Marty Fleck definitely makes him sound, you know, very warm and well-intentioned. And while we don't learn the exact reason behind his action in this batch of episodes, you do at least get the impression that he wasn't doing it all to be cruel. Uh, truth be told, though, I have a little bit more to say about Marty Fleck as a narrator because... Uh, he doubles to that too, and I definitely like that his narration sounds appropriately 80s, but without getting too cheesy with it. And it definitely helps to add a lot of atmosphere in general, since man has a kind of voice I definitely wouldn't get tired of listening to, even if he was reading a phone book. Uh, so I'm definitely glad they made that call there. Um, funny enough, he also does a narration in the reboot too. Um, so the most interesting character of this bunch is probably Tatsumi, because again, he's, he's kind of the worst. Uh, so to get into why this this guy's the worst, uh, this week in anime actually did a bit on the first few episodes of the show, and when they got around to talking about how dubious the Garand Foundation was, they mentioned that it's made even worse by the fact that this is the guy they put in charge of PR. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right. Oh my god, that's Ooh. that's a good point. Ooh. Wow, talk about putting your worst foot forward, jeez. <laughs> Uh, so this is a guy who really likes getting up to the boss and doesn't hesitate to smack literal orphans around when they make him look bad. And that's not even getting into the flashback where Baby Shun first learns he was getting sent to Death Queen Island before Icky took his place. And talks to me just goes on telling him, about, telling him about what a horrible place it is with like the biggest grin on his face. Like, uh, yeah, man, there's lava everywhere and almost no, no one ever comes back. Like, sucks to be you, kid. I mean, he doesn't actually say that, but he comes pretty darn close. And he's just so despicable, which makes it all the funny when one of the first things Icky does when he comes back is tell Tatsumi he's coming for him. And the look on that man's face just kind of tells him how much he messed up. Uh, I mentioned all this before getting into Ty's actual performance because it all requires a certain degree of punchability to really work. And while he didn't get as cheesy as I would have expected his delivery to be, he definitely makes Tatsumi sound very punchable and like he deserves everything bad that happens to him. And it's simply very amusing when it does. Uh, and honestly, I'm kind of a surprised how long this character actually ends up sticking around for, but if you want to see him get come up and stretch his chair, he gets dug on basically every opportunity from here on out. And uh, Tai is definitely a lot of fun to listen to, even if, again, Tatsumi is kind of the worst. Uh, but either way, all four of these performances were definitely a lot of fun to listen to. And with that, uh, we're finally good to get into our main characters, finally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so first up, we have Andromeda Shun and Phoenix Iki. Uh, Shun is the saint of the Andromeda constellation and another, one of, and another one of the orphans who was taken in by the Garan Foundation to be raised as a saint. And he's kind of the most averse to fighting. While Iki is the saint of the Phoenix constellation and he is Shun's older brother who was originally very kind and protective. But after he got sent to Death Queen Island, he resented Shun and the others, and became the leader of the Black Saints, serving as our first major villain. So, playing Iki, we have Adam Gibbs, and for Shun, we have Blake Jackson. Adam Gibbs is our stranger to this podcast, and he's played such characters as Georg from Black Clover, Kuku Urie from Tokyo Ghoul Re, and Kochi Sugiwara in Haikyuu. Uh, Blake Jackson, on the other hand, is a bit of a fresher face, and he's played such characters as... Apollo in Is It Wrong to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon Season 2, and Chigama Marume in Actors Hot Connection, and Shinji Watari in Haikyuu. So, uh, Roots, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah. Um, I do also... Actually, hold on on that one. Um, I really like Adam Gibbs' as Iki. Um, he gives the performance such a cold, angry, just sort of sneer to it, 
and it's like combine that with sort of the 80s ish script writing it makes him such a delicious villain um he just wants to destroy everything the foundation stands for and just do bad dick moves just to be he doesn't care that he's a bad guy he just he just wants to get back at the people who wronged him and I do have to say that the because he has this power that allows him to project the worst things in somebody's head yeah he he launches a punch and if it connects like you see your nightmares play out in front of you in real time and he gets that attack reflected back at him and while he's stuck in his own head i god i love the flashback honestly in both versions i mean other than the fact that his love interest gets fridged uh, basically to show that he is now full of hatred. Yeah, I, I really hated that part. You, you didn't care You didn't care for the part where they introduced a female character only to murder her off not ten minutes later? Uh, yeah, More that's a, yeah, that's a very... Yeah, I, I enjoy the show, but I, I, I don't know how closely it follows the manga, but it reminds me of when someone asked... Um, Larry Hama, the guy who used to do the G.I. Joe comic, how far in advance are you writing the story? And he's like, oh, about three pages. And it's like, there's not, there's not a lot of, I feel like there's yeah. not a lot of long-term planning going on in this story. It's just kind of like, this would be a cool fight scene. How can I motivate it? <laughs> I'm sorry, you were, talk you were talking. Anyway, um... I, I do... Other than that, the the stuff with him training on the island, um, with the master who's basically telling him, yeah, hey, I got this really cool mask, and it's telling me to tell you to abandon everything and hate everything. Ah, uh, yeah, that whole bit. Um, I don't know, and I, I don't know who was fighting that guy, but whoever it was, he was doing a very good job. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> no, the, he was very intimidating. Uh, and I really liked it in both the, um, both Saint Seiya and Knights of the Zodiac. Like, that was one of the things that I was really glad, you know, of... I was really disappointed when they kept the fridging in Knights of the Zodiac, but other than that, like, everything before that moment, I'm glad that they kept in for the reboot. Um, because it's a really good characterization moment for... Iki or Nero, depending on which version you're watching. I was, I was, oh yeah, we didn't get into that, but they changed some of the character names for Knights of the Zodiac, and uh, in that version they call Iki Nero, which is uh, that's a name, I guess. I think that's what he was called in the deep dub. Uh, I don't recall if they changed the names in the deep dub. They might have. I mean, I know they changed Sauri's name, but that's the only one I can remember. Yeah, because um, Sauri was also Sierra in the Deke dub, and that carried over into the reboot. So that's why I'm suspecting, like, this was a change made by Deke. Anyway. Um, great characterization moment. Um, Adam Gibbs really nailed that particular scene. And he's just a big, angry guy. Which is really what the show called for. And I guess... I'm assuming from the opening and ending credits, he redeems himself for the rest of the show. So that's cool. We get more of him. Ah, like, uh, like, uh, yes, he is about as dead as Sasuke Uchiha is. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's right, because he fell into the landslide. Look, look I've read a superhero dead. comic. If you don't see a body, that means nothing. They, they, can, they can just come back and <laughs> There six we months. go. Unless your name is Ben or whatever. Thomas and Martha? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Clark Kent's dad. I, I blank on the name. Oh, Jonathan? Oh, he, he comes back occasionally. 
<laughs> well, let, let me restate oh, that. He okay. died well, in the movie, you're... and then in the comics he was alive until about uh, seven, ten years ago. Something like that? I forget. This is, okay. this is... <laughs> so if your name is not... As long as your name isn't Ben Parker or um, either of the Wayne... Th Thomas and Martha. I'm blanking on names. Anyway... If you're not if you're not Batman's parents or Spider-Man's uncle, you're probably gonna come back at some point. You know, that is true. Um. So Shun, um, played by Blake Jackson in the in the actual dub, and um, fun fact. Renamed Sean in Knights of the Zodiac. Um, gender swapped to a girl and played by Lucy Christian. If I recall correctly. Uh, yeah, that was a, definitely a very big point of contention for this, for the reboot. I was actually kind of okay with it. That was just me, though. Um, but that's... Probably one of the bigger... Like, I digress points when I bring up the reboot. Anyway, um, in particular, Blake Jackson. Um, I I really like the fact that he was just a doting little brother who was trying to save his big brother. There's not really much to his character yet, but I know he does big things later. But that's the the big sticking point of the the Dark Saints arc is that his motivation is while they're given the orders to kill Iki, um, Shun has no intention to and just intends to save him, even will being willing to throw his own life away if it means bringing his brother back from the darkness. And I thought uh, Blake Jackson did a really great job with uh, the characterization that we have so far. Again, he's not, if I recall correctly, he's not so one note later on, but for now, yeah. But solid thumbs up performances nonetheless. Okay, uh, I'm on. Yeah, um, let's see. Yeah, you, you, you know this franchise better than I do. Is Shun's life pain? Because the impression I got for the first 15 episodes uh... is that his life is pain. Uh, his life isn't pain necessarily, but he does get some very, very, uh, weird stuff. Much uh, later poor on bastard. <laughs> he just, he, <laughs> he wants to be a nice guy. He wants to do nice things and, you know, not kill people. And he just wants to see his brother again. He doesn't, he's not asking for a lot. But the universe... No, no, no. Um, I, I also like Blake's, per I, I enjoy Blake's performance. I think he... Like, he does a good job of, I think, fitting into kind of, like, the 80s shonen action protagonist uh, kind of baseline that underlines a lot of the main characters, I think, while still being able to sell Shun on what I think is kind of, like, his essential, like, you know, sweetness. Like, Shun, Shun is a nice man. He wants to do, you know, he, ha he has these magic chains, he has his pink armor, he wants to do good things with that. And I think Blake does a good job of being able to combine those two elements that I don't think necessarily would, you know, would inherently work together, but he makes it work really well. <clears throat> um, I also think he plays well off of Adam Gibbs in this. Like, I think, um, at least in the, in this first set of episodes, I think the relationship between Shun and Iki presents some of the high melodrama that I think, um, you know, works well in this show. Uh, and I, especially, like, towards the end of episode 15, when, like, Shun's trying to pull Iki up the cliffside, and it looks like they're going to escape, and then Iki falls down, and Blake's like, no, no, we were supposed to start over again, no! Um, which, I, if I sound dopey, I'm not trying to make fun of it, I actually think he did a, I, I thought he nailed the emotion of that scene really well. Um, there's a, you know, this is, this is a very melodramatic show, you know, it, it is serious in a certain capacity, and very, very silly in another. Um, but I think you can definitely hear, like, the right balance in a lot of that performance. Um, and same goes for Adam Gibbs. I really enjoyed him. He is such a... He's just such a wonderful villain. It's just like, oh, that guy. I don't care. You're you're worse than I am, frankly. 
I'm gonna destroy your stupid little corporation and your dumb cloth plots and whatever you're doing. Um, he's just, he's very, he's just very, he's very good. There's a good, there's a good, like, not, not like, not like 80s cartoon, like, lead bad guy, but like the henchman who actually does most of the dirty work in his performance, I feel like. Um, I'm blanking on like, oh, the Destro. Yeah, exactly. Like, he's very, he, he's a good, he's, he very much feels like kind of the Destro kind of character. And I think he, he presents that really well of just like, he is, he's very, he is sincerely bad and he's going to let you know what exactly he is about. Um, but I enjoyed it, and I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that he's probably gonna come back, because I was enjoying his performance. I was a little bummed out when he, when he, uh, gets crushed in a landslide, because, like, is Saint Shea the kind of show where people don't stay dead very long? Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, no, Wiki's about the only real answer to oh, that. Oh, I see. <laughs> <sighs> oh. Well, I enjoy, I enjoyed these performances. I thought they, I thought they were both good by themselves, and I actually thought they worked really well together. Um, this is, this is a show right for, like, good high-class melodrama, and I thought they delivered on that really well. Okay, um, so I'll start with Blake Jackson as Shun. Uh, Shun, in general, is a character I have a lot of appreciation for, uh, because again, considering this character came out in an age where Jub still had muscle-bound titans like Kenshiro punching dudes in the Play-Doh, my boy Shun was out here rocking pink armor and looking about as traditionally non-masculine as you could get away with back then, um, so I thought that's pretty cool. And again, it's why I'm kind of disappointed the reboot decided to change him into a girl, since that kind of felt like the worst possible compound for putting more female characters in the show. I mean, like, they could have did it to Hyoga or someone else, and I would have been too bad, but it's just kind of annoying they did it to Shun specifically. Um, and uh, even though I had a lot of respect for Lucy Chris's performance, since uh, full disclosure, since the gummies are already out by now, I gave her my underrated performance for 2019. Uh, I'm so kind of re- I'm so kind of glad they recasted her for this one, and they gave Shun a male actor for this version. Uh, even though I am kind of curious how she might have played it if they had kept her. Uh, but anyway, I wasn't very familiar with Blake Jackson going into this dub. So much so that the so much so that the main thing that held up doing this episode was me trying to figure out who was playing Shun because I couldn't recognize the voice for the life of me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so out of all. Yeah, so out of all the main boys, his voice is definitely the most distinctly 80s, uh, in that it's both effeminate, but also a lot more masculine than would generally pass as an effeminate male voice in modern dubs, uh, which is kind of odd to listen to, but it definitely works for this. And uh, he did a good job of making Shun sound considerably softer than the other boys, except maybe Seiya. Uh, but, but without making him sound intentionally whiny, since Shun's, of course, more than capable of holding his own in the fight, uh, speaking of which, I kind of like how Blake shares Shu during some of his fights. Uh, since while Shu isn't, you know, bursting with confidence, he at least tries to warn people who are clearly ma- outmatched against him. You know, like poor old Jabu who just kind of gets one shot, which is so pretty funny. <laughs> and it's all a very nice touch. And, uh, of course, one of the big things for me here was seeing how he would bounce off of Adam against Ziki, since their relationship is very complicated. And since it is pretty vital, vital to the show, I thought that Blake did a very good job of making June's regrets about, you know, being responsible for all the suffering Icky went through on Death Queen Island feel very believable. And my only complaint is that his vocal delivery can sometimes sound a little flat compared to the other four, uh, but it definitely evens out pretty well with time. And for my first introduction to Blake Jackson, I was definitely pretty impressed, and I'm glad he's getting more work in Sentai. Uh, moving on to Adam gives Ziki. Uh, this one is pretty interesting because if you told me Saint Say was going to be was going to be redone with a Sentai cast, and you made me guess who was going to be Iki, he probably would have been at the very top of the list for me because it's a character that is definitely very much in his wheelhouse. Uh, Iki is a very edgy boy who has been through some stuff, and right away Adam's performance definitely ha- carries across the right level of edge, but with a very 80s flavor to it that makes him feel that the kind of guy who would, you know, Beat you up for your lunch money instead of prattling on about how dark the world is, even though he definitely does plenty of that. Uh, it's definitely a lot of fun to listen to, and since Iki is kind of the first major villain of the show, I like that Adam did a really great job making him sound genuinely menacing at points. I definitely appreciated that out of the main four, he was probably the best aside from Seiya's actor at shouting his attack names, uh, which is definitely very, very, very vital to the show, no question being it's important. <laughs> um... Like I mean, it's 80s shonen. You have true. to call out rules. your attack names. 
Uh, uh, like I mentioned before, though, when talking about Tatsumi, one of my favorite bits with him was definitely when he spots Tatsumi at the podium and immediately declares he's going to get revenge for the beating he gave him. And because that was definitely equal parts threatening and hilarious. And I definitely liked Adam's delivery when Iki is first introduced, and Shun is excited to see him again, only for Iki to go on about how weak he thinks Shun is. Uh, which is definitely kind of harsh, but also immediately gets across how macho he is. It, uh, but of course, while Iki is very edgy, uh, we do see some softer side of him, too, during all his flashbacks. And I appreciate that Adam did an equally good job of, you know, making him sound very kind and heroic when he offered to take Shun's place on Death Queen Island. And it kind of helps to make the contrast between him back then and him now feel a little tragic. And speaking of tragic, it's of course hard to talk about Iki without, you know, talking about what happens to his not-girlfriend Esmeralda. And, again, while the whole getting something to frames thing is kind of predictable and a little annoying. Uh, seeing Iki getting put to the point of pure hate by his master was kind of as sad as it was cheesy. And I really felt for the poor guy when he finally stopped and killed him, only to be too late to save her. And I definitely that Adam I definitely that Adam's only right mix of hate and loss that Iki was going through at that moment pretty well. And it kinda helps to give you a pretty clear picture of why he is the way he is now. Uh I, it was definitely a very good performance from Adam Gibbs. And again, I don't feel like I'm spoiling too much by thinking he comes back because again, of course he's not dead. Um uh, so you'll be seeing a lot more of this edgy little wolf in later episodes, and Adam Gibbs was definitely a great pick for him. And uh, with that, uh, we're good to move on to uh, to our next pair of saints. Uh, we have the Saint of the Cygnus Constellation, Cygnus Yoga, and the Saint of the Dragon Constellation, Dragon Shiryu. Uh, out of curiosity, Avon, since you did not see the Knights of the Zodiac Dumb, would you like to know what they renamed Yoga for, for that virgin? Cygnus Magnus. <laughs> <laughs> Air, airbrushed on the side of the van, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's, that, that is the name of a character who shows up in the plotline in the booklet that comes with the prog rock album, but is never actually mentioned in any of the songs. Maybe maybe he has like an instrumental subsection named after him. That's the most he's going to get. Uh, that's, uh, that's, 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 just... that's kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, Pyoka's statement in Dice of the Zodiac for it, I guess, but if you think that's weird, uh, you should definitely hear what they call him, Chiryu, they call him Dragon Long, which is, a uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, anyway, uh, we should get to who plays these two. Uh, so, playing Kyoga, we have Patrick Poole, and for Shiryu, we have Blake Shepard. Uh, Shiryu, I mean, oh, God. Uh, Patrick Poole has played such characters as Mitsuru Sotsuna in Food Wars that can play. Hayato Oda in My Love Story, and because you can never, ever, ever truly escape this franchise, Fate Clid Lighter Prisma Ilya. Uh, he plays Shiro Emiya. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> the like, one yeah, piece of the fran Fate franchise <laughs> Team Grimgar will probably never touch. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, Blake Shepard, on the other hand, has played such characters as Makuro Kurakami and Mideka Box, uh, Hisashi Kideshita in Haikyuu, and uh, everyone's favorite Shonen protagonist, uh, Yukihiro Soba in Food Wars. Hey. I need to start Food yeah. Wars now that I think of it. Uh, do yourself a favor. Uh, stop after season three. You don't need to go any further than that. I've heard. Once you get to set, once you get to central, stop. Uh, so, uh, on that note, Ruth, would you like to start us off? Um, sure. I I like Patrick Poole's performance as uh, Hyoga. Um. I actually, in this case, I like the character's story arc in Knights of the Zodiac a little better. Um, just because he gets some really interesting things to do right before, you know, shit hits the fan. Um, like, in, in the reboot version, he is an assassin sent to kill, um, Saori. 
or Sienna, I guess in this case, because you know name changes and everything. Uh, and then he just decides not to do it because she talks him out of it. And I thought that was an interesting thing to throw into the character because they also they also do a lot of interesting things with the lore. They accelerate a lot that happens much much later. Yeah, uh, 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 yeah, that yeah, that is the one thing I probably will praise Reed before they definitely do attempt to kind of weave the lore together more. Uh, because uh, because again, uh, uh, Karamata, I don't think he really had a very clear outline of when he was actually publishing the manga. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> Weekly Shonen Jump in the 1980s. You were kind of in for that. As <laughs> the editor note, the editor's note for the next <laughs> chapter is just more punching. I mean, if Dragon Ball has taught us anything, it's that you can just make shit up in Weekly Shonen Jump, and the editors are just like, "Yeah, can you do more of that?" Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It really is amazing. It, it really <laughs> is amazing how much the stuff in the cell arc actually feels like it was planned out, even though Toriyama admits he was writing it week to week. Yeah, um, but anyway, I um. I really do like Patrick Poole's performance. Um, in terms of the actual anime, um, I like his fight with his dark self. Or the um, the Black Knight version of himself. Oh, so, uh, so, oh yeah, uh, it is worth noting that while, uh, uh, that while not credited, while not technically credited, if you pay close enough attention, it is definitely Patrick Poole voicing the evil version of himself. Yeah, I mean, now that you mention that, like, that is a really cool touch that, um, from the sound of it, all of the actors play their Black Knight counterpart. Yeah, pretty much. I don't know if that's also mm. the case in the Japanese version, but I thought that was a really cool touch. Um, but as I was saying, I, I really like the fight where he's, um, he's fighting his, his Black Knight counterpart. Because for some reason, um, Iki brings four Black Knights with him to steal the Golden Armor of Sagittarius, who just happen to have the same powers as the four knights that decide to follow him. Hmm, curious. Uh, 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 yeah, it's uh, definitely very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> um... But I, I love that fight because his, I guess I can talk about his dark cap because it's played by the same actor, um, where he gets defeated and he's just like, yeah, ha ha ha, um, I'm going to break the little swan head off of my armor helmet because it saw everything and now Iki's going to know all of your powers, ha ha ha. And then he dies. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, that is one thing you probably should note about the show. Is that it? Is that because it takes place in the nineteen? Is that because it's a nineteen eighty show? And and standards were much more lax back then. Things like your main character is killing people was a lot more was definitely considered a lot more okay, and it wasn't as as taboo as it is now. So, uh, so yeah. yeah, so there's, so there's definitely much more mm. casual murder in this show than you would expect. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean. A lot more casual yeah, yeah. murder. <laughs> yeah, what, watching this has made it very obvious why this never got TV in America during the Reagan years. Like, no amount of editing would have made this um, television. Uh, but not to mention, a bunch of references to, like, actual Judeo-Christian hell come up later on. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Which... <laughs> Oh, I would, I would love to be a fly on the wall for whatever TV censor meetings come up for for it if they had actually tried to bring this to U.S. televisions in the eighties. Yep, yeah, uh, it was a definitely very uh, odd thing to try to attempt it in two thousand and three. I mean, I don't even remember anything about that dub other than the song, but just hearing about the edits, it's kind of funny. 
Apparently they gave Yoga a Surfer Dude accent in that dub, so I'm kind of curious to listen to it now. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, like, Hyoga was a really great sort of the... He felt like he was put into the group as, like, the serious one. Uh, yeah, that definitely very much feels like his role. And I think Patrick Poole did a really good job with that. Um, Blake Shepard as Shiryu. Um, a lot of this first arc um, rests on his shoulders. In kind of surprising ways, because he's not with the not with the other Bronze Knights as they're trying to recover the golden armor of Sagittarius. He goes back to China in order to find the person who can repair his and Seiya's uh, bronze armor. So, he's kind of sidelined for most of the story arc and doesn't show up until, like, much later. Uh, but at the same time, like, that mission is critical, and the anime spends a good, I want to say, two episodes on his journey to, to find Master Mu, who can repair the armor. Which, by the way, I did look at the wiki and son of a... <laughs> <laughs> I told you. Because... <laughs> The fact that he can repair the armor makes a whole lot more sense now. Uh. I'm actually kind of mad I didn't figure this out before. Because I, I know a thing or two about Greek mythology. <laughs> anyway. Um, story arc he's involved in is really important. Um, I think the standout, though, is his fight with Seiya. Um, right before shit, shit hits a fan. Um, where he's fighting, and basically, um, he and Seiya break each other's armor. Uh, to the point where, you know, if they actually come to blows, they could actually kill each other. Spoiler alert. Yeah, they c <clears throat> they kind of do. <laughs> <laughs> Almost um, literally in this case. And I love the fact that, oh, yeah, because um, Shiryu, like, actually reaches the point of death, like, twice in the story arc. Um, but that first time, it's like, oh, yeah, um, Seiya, you're going to have to punch him back to life. And I'm... When that when they uh, when they said that you know you have to use your um, Pegasus meteor punch on him to reactivate his Cosmo, I'm just like I'm reminded of the um, the old Tumblr joke. Um, don't surgeons just have to stab people back to life? <laughs> and somebody else responds like, "Never give this man a medical license." and like, I thought that was really funny. Anyway, <laughs> um, Blake Shepard as Shiryu's actor has to hold a lot of the story of this first arc on his shoulders, and I think he does a really good job. Um, Shiryu, uh, his personality is very stoic, and he doesn't wear a lot of emotion on his sleeve. Um... And Blake Shepard does a really good job with that, while at the same time not playing Shiryu as sort of the, you know, the the robot character. The complete emotionless, um, just there to get the job done kind of role. But uh, he does a really good job with that. Uh, very kind of a tightrope performance, because, you know, uh, if you go a little too hard with stoic characters they tend to sound um very monotone and thankfully Blake Shepard doesn't do that so thumbs up to both of these performances okay uh, I'm on yeah I'm in agreement um I like Patrick as Hyoga he he feels like he's kind of the 
the, he's the brash hothead of the group. Uh, he's not quite an asshole, but he's a little bit of a jerk, and that gives him a little bit of an edge to his character, which I I, I find it very funny that it's given to the guy who's, um, uh, whose constellation is, you know, a, a Cygnus. <laughs> you know, it's a... It's a which, which is a kind of that's a kind of swan, right? It's a, I'm not making yeah, that up. It's, it's a swan. It's like it's that. Yeah, yeah. I, f- I find that very funny. <laughs> so, oh, oh yeah, uh, it's something we haven't yet talked about. But the way the powers work in this show is that the characters have to like physically draw out their constellations in order to make their powers work. So Hyoga literally <laughs> has to pose like a swan to do his attacks. <laughs> it's the most amazing thing. <laughs> I mean, and also, Phoenix Siki has to flap his arms like wings, and it's ridiculous, and it's great, because it's, it's so 80s. Uh, okay, yeah, sorry, I'm on. No problem. Uh, what else? Um, yeah, no, he's, I, I just find him very fun. He's, 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 he's having, he's, he's very good at this kind of, like, brash, hot-headed character who's gonna get into fights and fight a clone of himself. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed him a lot when he's having that fight with Hydra Ichi earlier. I like his fight with um, Iki a lot. Uh, he's 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 a good he's a good fun fit for the character. Um, I'm not familiar with Patrick, and I'm not sure I've heard him in a lot of things, but I enjoyed him a lot here. He, he feels like an actor who I'd want to seek out more stuff by. He's yeah, I'm I'm digging his stuff. Uh, and I agree I agree with all of what just saying about Blake Shepard's performance. I think he does a good job of playing the most relatively stoic of the main characters, um, but he doesn't sound robotic. He still sounds very um, authentic as far as kind of like this show and its style goes, I guess. Uh, you know, they're not exactly reaching for straight realism here, but you know, he, he sounds very in tune with what the character's about. Uh, he fits in with kind of the general style really well. Um, he has a good moments. Like, I, I like him, and I think he, 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 Blake, I think, does very well, especially considering that Shiryu does have to spend so much of those first 13 episodes, like, away from the rest of the cast, off in his own little corner, fighting with his master, getting the armor repaired, that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, like, these are, I thought these are two very good performances, uh, and I think they were very well cast, given that they are going to be main characters and, you know, in a lot of the show. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, cool. Uh, so I talked about Patrick Poole. Uh, well, I've read him in a few other things before this. I totally wasn't, like, too impressed with what I'd seen of him before since I thought some of his other work felt a little stilted. Uh, but I definitely really liked him here as Hyoka. Uh, while Hyoka isn't quite as edgy as Iki is, he definitely has a much colder attitude, no pun intended there, uh, than a lot of the others do. And Patrick's performance definitely reflects that, and it sounds very harsh while it needs to. While also just, you know, generally making Hyoka feel kind of prickly and like he's very much trying to be the serious one. Uh, but of course, while Hyoka might act tough, deep down he's very much a mama's boy. Uh, so I like that Patrick's tone softens up a little bit whenever Hyoka's dealing about his dearly departed mom sleeping at the bottom of the ocean because, again, this is anime. <laughs> uh, and the vulnerability he gives off in those moments kind of shows how much it so clearly affects me if we don't know all the details behind that just yet. Uh, well, there aren't any super set-up moments for Patrick, since Hyoka kind of has the least to do of the main five in this past episodes. I definitely did like the bit where uh, he battles Iki, and Iki, <clears throat> and Iki uses his specter punch to hop him with images of his mom being zombified. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and to see that take Hyoka off is uh, definitely a bit of an understatement. I definitely liked how Patrick's performance definitely gave up the vibe that Hyoka was out for blood in that moment. Uh, even if he wasn't terribly successful at it, uh, uh, but it was so pretty funny. Uh, also, as a si- also as an aside, I definitely liked how delightfully cartoony Patrick made uh, the black swan sound, and it was def- and it was actually thanks to how exaggerated that was that I was able to connect the dots until he was pulling double duty again, and telling he was pulling double duty there, uh, which again definitely helps to add a little bit of extra spice to this dub. I definitely like the evil version of him the best out of the four, even if you can kind of tell he's straining himself a little bit to maintain that voice. It was so pretty funny. Uh, but as much as I enjoyed Patrick, the set out here for me is definitely Blake Shepard and Shiryu. And uh, it's kind of funny because if I were casting a Saint Seiya dub in Houston's talent, Blake Shepard is probably one of the last people I'd pick. Uh, the main reason being that Shiryu Seiya has always kind of had a pretty deep voice despite how old the character is technically supposed to be. And even in the ADV dub, they put Jay Hickman there, so Blake Shepard is kind of a weird pick considering his voice is on the softer end. And so it is kind of fun. So it is kind of uh, 
weird compared to who played Hyoga in the ADV dub. I'm kind of curious, Rude. Who do you think they cast as Hyoga in the ADV dub? Mm. Okay, as I hit that. Okay, as I hit it's a person who's still around now. <laughs> it's a person you can hear on Tsunami. Yeah, it doesn't quite feel like a. Um, it doesn't feel like a like a Greg Ayers kind of role. Um, hmm. Um, unfortunately, I also don't get Toonami anymore, so... It's, like, it's, like, uh, it's okay. It was Jason Douglas. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. I am... Wow. I'm I'm kind of curious about this now. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a, that's definitely a very, very weird kind of choice. I really kind of want to check that out now. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's only, like I've said before, Blade's voice is definitely on the softer end, but, uh, he definitely really manages to make the performance work. Uh, right off the bat, he does a really great job of making Shiryu come off as, you know, the most knightly and honorable of the group. And, uh, he sells that well enough that it doesn't feel too weird when Shiryu becomes devoted to helping Seiya when Seiya restarts his heart, even if Seiya was kind of the guy who almost killed him to begin with. And I also like that there's just this very great sense of natural competence to his voice that helps to give the impression that Shiryu is a guy who takes a lot of pride in his training. And it definitely helps him to bounce off pretty well against some of his opponents. Uh, but of course what's really nice about Shiryu is that he did that even more than Seiya himself, he's the kind of guy who's willing to do anything to help his friends. And of course the best example of that would probably be where he goes to Moo to get his and Seiya's claws repaired and he's told the only way he can do it is to sacrifice enough of his own blood to put his life at risk. And uh, while that's obviously a pretty dicey decision, Shiryu doesn't hesitate to do it to help the others. And there's just the right level of conviction and sincerity in Blake's performance during that scene to help add some genuine drama to what otherwise could have been really silly. And it personally helped to reestablish Shiryu as my personal best boy in the show. I also really liked his delivery where Shiryu defeats his evil knockoff, the Black Dragon, both through the power of friendship and the power of kicking 80s insert music because that song was really good. <laughs> oh, damn straight. <laughs> yeah, and I also like that when he defeats Black Dragon and Black Dragon is fully dying, he tells us that while he may have died, he gained a friend, which is simultaneously touching and kind of weird considering that Shiryu is the guy who just killed him. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's also some great 80s cheese right there. Yeah. Uh, that's... Like, the whole ending, his whole ending speech about the power of friendship. Yeah, that was so great. <laughs> and just aside, Blake's delivery so felt pretty sincere despite how weird of a scene that was. And it definitely cemented it as my personal favorite performance of the dub, and quite possibly my favorite role of Blake Shepard's. Uh, so uh, if there's one nitpick I have, it's that I think his voice for Black Dragon was probably the least succinct of the Black Saints. Uh, to the point where you could kind of tell right away he was voicing both of them, but it still worked out pretty well when I got a pretty good kick out of it. Uh, and with that, we are going to move on to our final pair of the evening. Uh, we have the Saints of the Pegasus Constellation, Pegasus Seiya, and Saori Kido. Uh, Seiya is another one of the orphans taken again by the Garan Foundation after he was separated from his sister, and he became a saint in order to be reunited with her. And Saori Kido, on the other hand, is the current head of the Garan Foundation after her grandfather passed away. And she takes charge of the Bronze Saints in their battle against various evil forces. I technically can't say more than that based on the first 15 episodes, but if you have seen literally any image of Saint Seiya anywhere, you probably have a good idea of how important her character technically is. And, like, if you've seen, like, even, even, like, five minutes of the Knights of the Zodiac reboot, like, they flat out tell you. It's like, yeah, it's kind of gotten to the point where pretty much every bit of Saint Seiya media is like, look, we, it's like, look, we're not gonna, we're not gonna take a code it, you know who she is. This is it. Right. Uh, so, uh, Abad, would you like to go first? I mean, oh. <laughs> do you want to say who's playing these characters before I do start? Sorry, I'm tired. No, I, I feel oh, like absolutely, <laughs> I feel Okay, good. uh, so, playing... So playing Sari, we have Emily Names, and for Seiya, we have one Bryson Vegas. Emily Names displays such characters as Mayu in Tokyo Ghoul 3, um, Eri in My Hero Academia, uh, Kachomi Ichinose in Clanad, and Saki Watanabe in From the New World. 
Uh, Brains and Vegas has played such characters as Belle Crado in Is It Rock to Pick Up, pick up Girls in a Dungeon, Kimihito Kurizu, aka Darling Coon, in Monster Mutsume, Takami El Dini in Food Wars, and another Shonen Jump protagonist, Shoyo Hinata from Haikyuu. And now I'm on Big Go. Certainly. Um, where to start? I like Emily's performance. Um, I'm not as familiar with the uh, Knights of Saint Seiya as general as I mentioned before, so uh, I don't really know where. Sorry, I don't know really know where her character's going in the grand scheme of things. Um, but I liked, I liked her performance a lot. I thought she did a good job playing the kind of. She's not evil, especially compared to the guy she's hanging out with all the time. Uh, but there's a certain distant iciness to her, which I thought Emily communicated really well. Um, but she's she seems like more of an actual like well-rounded person, um, which I I, I it's I, I don't have too much to say. Like I thought it was a very strong performance because I don't I, I think she didn't get to do quite as much compared to everyone else, and I feel like what she gets to do expands in the episodes I haven't seen yet. But I thought she gave like she gave a strong performance, and I'm curious to see where things go because there's clearly like stuff in there, uh, and I I'm, I'm I'm excited to see what happens from there. Um, Bryson, uh, he's a hoot, I think. He, if, if I had a slight complaint, it's that he's maybe, maybe a little more generic sounding than some of the other saints, but given that he's also the main character, I feel like that's a little forgivable. Like, he's the, he's the standard, and everyone else is the variant. Um, uh, and I think he just does a really good, strong, like, you know, 80s action shonen hero voice. Um, like, he would sound right at home on a, on a dub for, like, any other show from this era uh, like again voltron comes to mind like he's definitely the keith of this show uh, and i think he does well i think he does really well in that like i think he knows how to have that keep that tone but also like still carry a lot of the show that's on him especially when he is again getting into like kind of the the big melodrama of like you know he's he's weakened he's, he's he might be dying but he's still gonna kick Iki's ass if he has to um yeah i just i i enjoy, I enjoy these performances i think you know for Significant, you know, for the big main characters, I think they, they these are well cast. I think the performances behind them are good. And, uh, excuse me, I am excited to see where they go from here. Uh, cool. Uh, Roots. Yeah, so, um, in the actual anime, um, Saori is played with sort of a level of moral ambiguity. And I think Emily Neves got that down really well. Um, in the reboot, uh, that sort of ambiguity is more replaced with a sense of duty and, like, of all the performances that I can compare the two directly, um, Sauri and Seiya are both, like, the most interesting to me. Um, as I, as I mentioned with, um, with Sauri and Sienna, and I'm not gonna not gonna spoil the big twist that is revealed, like, five minutes into Knights of the Zodiac, just so... You know, I'd like Amon to be able to experience that little bit for himself. I appreciate it. Um... I've gotta say that... It's not Bryson's doing. It's more the show itself and the writing and just sort of... You know, 80 shonen tropes. Um, he's not exactly likable for the first, I would say, seven or eight episodes. Uh, basically through the Galaxian Wars tournament. Um, right before Iki shows up. Um, he's kind of an annoying little shit. Like, he, he talks back to everyone, um... He particularly gives a lot of lip to Sauri. And, um... And... And, 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 um... And he also gives a lot of that lip to, uh, to Marin while he's being trained. Um... Like, he's not a very good good person in those first couple episodes to the women of the show. Um, 
Megan act was actually starting to watch this with us, and it really kind of bugged her. So uh, yeah, this was uh, originally going to be a four-person episode, but uh, that didn't quite pan out. Um, I will say though that in the the Knights of the Zodiac reboot, um, that's sort of not present because a lot of the moral ambiguity of taking a bunch of orphans and shipping them across the world in order to basically die for these cloths, um, that doesn't end up happening. Not At least not in the way that it does um, in the original manga and the anime. Uh, it is, in that case, it's basically just a bunch of random people being trained for these cloths in their individual areas and then coming back together. Um, so, the sort of, he's an asshole to everybody around him just isn't necessary. Um, I think that makes him, as a character, a little bit more approachable in the reboot. Um, but I do have to say that in the original anime, uh, right around the point where he fights his dark counterpart, and he gets infected with like, some sort of magic poison that will slowly bruise up his body to the point where he dies. Uh, and just him fighting that off as best he can until he can get to Iki. Um, I think that was some of the best, per, uh, best characterization in the show. And Bryson got that down really good. Uh, so, performance-wise, I really like the both of them. Uh, even if the show really isn't doing either of them very much in the way of favors. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, I'll start with Emily Nades and sorry, since um, I've gotten pretty familiar with uh, Emily Nades' range ever since I first heard her as Ringo and Penguin Drum back in the day. And uh, while that might seem very negative, given I've been pretty vocal about how I feel about that dub, uh, she was kind of the stand out there she basically carried that whole dub on her back so i've always been happy to see her get more work uh, and as far as this role goes i definitely liked how in the first few episodes and that once he doesn't make sorry come off as like too much of a snooty rich girl she definitely acts you know very privileged and she's willing to use that privilege to, to her advantage when she's interacting with sam and uh, mostly when she kind of manipulates him into participating in the galactic wars by dangling the promise of Advocate being reunited with his sister. I also like that there's this very strong sense of authority in her voice, which is good since, you know, she's currently the head of a very big organization. And that she maintains that when, uh, you know, uh, interacting with the public, and she has a very good business like attitude. And uh, it's definitely very important considering where her character goes later on. Uh, but while she does spend a lot of the early episodes behind that wall of privilege, we do get to see a little more. A little bit of her softer side when she's, you know, reminiscing, reminiscing, uh, sorry, reminiscing about her late grandfather, or you know, talking with his forest ghosts or cosmo ghosts or whatever it is. Uh, and I thought that Emily did a very good job of, you know, showing her vulnerable side in those moments, and her doubts about leading the scene since she's never really gotten to walk with them very well. I also appreciated that after the bit where her grandfather's ghost tells her she needs to, like, top it up a little bit, you do see Emily's tone kind of uh, get a little bit lighter and she's a little bit uh, nicer around the others after that. And I definitely liked her delivery during the bit where she accidentally walks in on Sam shirtless and you can just tell in her brain she's thinking, oh no, he's hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, she put on a pretty solid performance so far and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing how she handles some of the later stuff considering how important her character because later on, because again, it's so important, it is literally the thing advertised in every other iteration of Saint Seiya. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that. And uh, speaking of Saint Seiya, I should probably talking about, be talking about him and Bryce's performance. Uh, so I imagine a lot more folks are familiar with him as Hinata and Haikyuu. Uh, my first introduction to Bryson as an actor was probably in a ye old indie show called Monster Musume, where he played the very important and vital role of Darling Coon. And yes, I know that character has an actual name, but he will always just be Darling Coon to me. Uh, anyway, when he was just playing... Anyway, even when he, he was just playing an insert hair protagonist, Bryson had the kind of voice that made me immediately think, you know, I could see this guy playing a battle 
playing a battle shield in protagonist someday. And sure enough, I was right. It just took about five years. Uh, so right away, he gives a very natural sense of energy and confidence that kind of fits like a glove. And he's a lot of fun to listen to, whether he's bouncing off of the other characters or he's in the middle of a fight. And it helps that Seiya can be pretty sassy when he wants to be. And while I mentioned before, I think it's a pretty good kick when he's, you know, uh, talking about Jabu. And I like Bryce's delivery where he talks about how Jabu just kind of always wagged its tail with Sari like a good little dog. Uh... I also liked the bit where, you know, he got the very brilliant idea that he could somehow track down Iki with a police dog. And he just sounded so terribly convinced it was going to work, only for it to fail miserably, and I thought the whole, that whole bit was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, funny as it can be at times, though, like Shiryu, he is also a guy who very clearly values honor and friendship and all that good jazz. I don't like that Bryson carries a very, you know, strong sense of justice, but in his performance, I never say Zuki get out. And since we during Seiya's last fight with Iki, where Seiya suddenly gains the power of all the other Saiyans and just kind of rolls with it, because, you know, the power of friendship between them is just that strong, and he definitely believes that 100%. Uh, he's been a lot of fun to listen to so far, and I'm definitely glad he was able to give such an iconic role justice. And uh, given that Seiya's original Seiya is Toyo Furia, uh, that's definitely some pretty high praise. And if you don't know who Toyo Furia is, he was the original Tuxedo Mask from Sailor Moon, so uh, he's definitely been around a long time. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, as a bit of a fun fact, Toyo Furia can actually still do a Seiya voice, even though it's been a few decades. And he actually came back to do it in Saint Seiya Omega. Uh, but uh, he's mostly been replaced in, mo in modern stuff by uh, Mata Kajimorita, uh who you might know as Ichigo from Bleach. Uh, anyway, Furia can still do the same voice, but doesn't really like coming back to do it because uh, he Toei usually doesn't get back most of the original cast, and Furia doesn't like to do it without them. So, uh, I think it's pretty nice that he's, you know, wants to uh, do it with the uh, do it with the old guard. That's pretty neat. Uh, but uh, anyway, I think that Bryson was a pretty good pick for Seiya, and, and while his line read is going to be a little shaky every once in a while on the whole, I think it's a pretty strong performance. And I was also very amused by how he played Black Pegasus, since it's probably the deepest I heard Bryson's voice go. And uh, it's kind of a shame that Black Pegasus is the one that gets taken out the quick, the quickest out of the Black Saints, so we don't get to hear him that much, but it was still pretty fun for what we heard of it. Uh, but, uh, anyway, I think Bryson is doing a really good job here, and I think it was a pretty good fit for Seiya, but I'm definitely glad they casted him here. Mm hmm Uh, and, uh, with that, we are going to move into final thoughts. So, um, I'm on with you want to go first. Uh, this dub's a hoot. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying this. As someone who's never seen Saint Seiya before, this has really been a really fun way to watch it. Uh, it's very much to my speed. I think it is very solid. I think it's very true to like what Saint Say is as a show, as you know, as like it's a very very nineteen eighties shown in anime. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm I'm glad. I'm impressed that they've gotten through as much of the show as they have for the dub already, and I'm I'm hoping they can do the whole thing. Like this would be this would be great, and it seems like they've done have they done a second batch of episodes i want to say they i want to say i saw somewhere they put up another set after the first like 40 or so went up yeah they're up to like 60 70, 70. something There's a, nice. a, yeah they're on 70 something right now all right well and nothing else that suggests that netflix has enough confidence that they might actually be able to like cross 114 so good on them okay uh roots yeah this um this dub is a really interesting time capsule um it encapsulates a lot of what makes um the 80s dubs of beloved anime like really kind of that cheesy fun like they, it, this dub is an absolute blast to watch um i definitely have um weird grievances and sticking points with the show itself but I can't say that the dub isn't at least fun. Uh, uh, the characters are great. They get, like, little great punchy 80s one-liners, and it, it's just wonderful to behold. Um, and also, on a side note, I do want to say that um, the 
recent reboot from Toei's CG Animation Studio. Um, it's actually kind of fun from the six episodes I've seen. Uh, definitely a different take on the franchise, but I actually do enjoy it a, a bit. So, um, I would definitely recommend watching the anime first, but, you know, they're, they're both a good time and definitely worth a watch. Cool. Um, uh, so, as for me, um, uh, so this is a job I didn't think I'd ever be talking about, but I guess it goes to show that anything is possible when giant corporations get involved in anime and that they can be benevolent every once in a while. So, uh, Netflix, if you're listening and you want to, uh, potentially do a dub for Saints and Omega, just give it the sound cadence, that would be cool. Or, hey, Toei, if you, or, hey, Toei, if you can find some decent masters of Fits in a North Star, uh, that could use a new dub, that would be cool. I mean, okay, I mean, sure, that's like 104 episodes, but, I mean, hey, if you do this, anything's possible, right? Dub Dr. I, Slump, you cowards. <laughs> See, that one I can get on board with. Uh, uh, so, uh, anyway, it's not a perfect dub, and it does sound a little rough around the edges every once in a while, but I feel like it works pretty well for what Saint Say is. And what say it say is a pretty fun fusion of Sokusatsu and 80s machismo that, you know, despite some pretty annoying setbacks revolving how the show treats women, uh, it's still a pretty fun watch, and it's definitely pretty easy to see how it's spawned into such a big franchise in Japan. And uh, even if you're just curious about anime history in general, it's definitely worth at least giving a peek. And uh, if you would like to check out Saint Seiya, Knights of the Zodiac, uh, as we have no doubt gone over many times here, you can watch it on Netflix currently. Um, that is the only place you can watch a new dub, or, yeah, or the only place the show is streaming in general. I think it is still streaming on Crunchyroll in other countries, but as far as North America is concerned, only Netflix. Uh, if you are curious to check out any of the other Saint Seiya stuff, like Saint Seiya Omega, or, say, or Saint Seiya The Lost Canvas, those you can actually find on Crunchyroll, I believe. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure Saint Seiya Omega is still up, I'm not sure about The Lost Canvas. Uh, the Lost Canvas is also on Netflix, and that also has a dub if you're curious to check that one out. Uh, but, um... As I, uh, before we sign out here, though, uh, Rude Saban, do you guys have anything you want to plug? Um, sure. Um, you can find me on the Twitter.com at Roots Justice. Um, I mainly just retweet cute animal pics. I talk general fandom stuff. I And I've also started to be a little more outspoken about things on my Twitter account, so... Come on in, check it out, hang out, have a good time. Um, also, I'm writing reviews, and I'm going to find somewhere to post them eventually. Ah, cool. Nice. Uh, if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at AmonDuelUS. Uh, Duel has two U's in it. I talk about movies and comic books and manga and music. And I have a dusty old song, if people would care for one. Oh, uh, yes, what Coming is your up. dusty old song for tonight? Well, as we all know, uh, uh, Saint Seiya has a lot of really cool, uh, you know, sort of 80s rock music. Um, uh, but I'm not going to talk about anything resembling that. I'm going to talk something much more embarrassingly nerdy. Uh, I'm going to recommend the a prime slice of 1960s kitsch called the Zodiac Cosmic Sounds. Uh, it is unclear whether the Zodiac is the name of the album or the name of the group making it, to give you an idea of how well organized this is. Uh, and it is a it is a concept album with a bunch of songs about, you know, the various Zodiac signs, sort of early Moog synthesizer, 60s rock kind of stuff. Uh, it is the kind of thing where I'm not entirely sure whether my enjoyment of it is sincere or not, but I don't really care. Uh, also, fun fact for you nerds out there, uh, the music on it was written by a guy named Mort Garson. And if that sounds familiar, it's because a song of his called Deja Vu was used as the main theme for the balance arc of the, of the podcast, The Adventure Zone. Uh, so that should give you an idea of the kind of music it sounds like. Uh, so go check that out. It's on Spotify and stuff. Hmm. Uh, cool. And uh, if you're, as for me, I am Chet. Uh, 
aka Divine Nega. You can find me on Twitter at Divine Nega, where I usually uh, be talking about anime, cartoons, or like whatever. Uh, you can also occasionally find me on my blog, Animation Infinity, where I will sometimes write reviews if I feel up to it. Uh, but if you'd like to, okay, but if you'd like to follow anything we nerds are up to, we are the Dub Talk Podcast. Uh, you can find us on. Uh, you can find us here on YouTube, and uh, so, uh, you can talk to us on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, Tumblr is dead, obviously. Uh, do we have any other social media accounts that I'm forgetting about? Um, we have we have a Twitch account that we occasionally um, broadcast games that we play on. Um, generally, we'll announce via our Twitter if we're doing anything with that. So. Mm-hmm. Um. So we also have a uh, a Kofi and a Patreon account. Um, at this moment, we would like to plug our patrons. Starting at the five dollar tier, where we have Crimson Echidna, Michelle Travis, and Nico Robin, but with the owie hands. Um, and in our ten dollar tier, we have Carly Lessacow, Jacob Wilson, J Two AKA Jared, Marissa Lenti, and Weeby. Hey, uh, thanks for all your support, guys. You all seriously awesome. We couldn't You're do right. this without you. <clears throat> and uh, with that, we're basically done for tonight. Thanks for taking us out with you guys. Woo! Yeah. Um, so I guess with that, we're planning off tonight because it's getting really late. And, <laughs> and uh, boy, I'm trying to think of a really bad way to just reference Iran, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'm tired, so I can't think of anything. I ran away from the Deke dub, but you shouldn't run away from this one. You uh, cannot they... get away. Disclaimer, I've never seen the Deke dub. I wasn't watching Saturday morning cartoons by the time it was airing. It's okay. Uh, uh, I'm, pretty sure, I'm pretty sure they had that one on Old Toonami. Uh, no, it wasn't on Old Toonami. It was on that Cartoon Network Saturday Night block that basically was Toonami but wasn't Toonami. Is it, yeah, it's just like I just like very vaguely remember seeing like the credits for it and being like, "Wow, this looks weird." <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but anyway, uh, that's basically it for us tonight. And uh, so again, thanks for listening. And until next time, I'll talk a lot, my friends. Peace. Otaku on the Debas, and remember. Cosmo is a part of you. Rock on, Boston. Rock on, Greece, I guess. I don't know.